Hey everybody, it's Dominic Gergiev from The Break It Down Show and today's guest is Jack Hughes. Jack Hughes, the singer, songwriter and composer best known as the frontman for Wang Chong, has today announced the release of his second solo album Electroacoustic Works 2020. This was written and recorded during the national lockdowns along with a series of shows for September 2021. In standard times, Jack would have spent most of 2020 performing in the USA and Europe, promoting his first solo album called Primitive, but as the pandemic shut the world down, Jack set his living room up as a studio and began writing and recording ideas. Get to jackhughes.com to learn more about Jack's tour dates and music. If you want to support the Break It Down Show, go to breakitdownshow.com and donate to the PayPal link, or you can simply subscribe to any podcast platform, you can buy our merch, or watch our videos for free on YouTube. Don't forget to donate to our veteran friends at savethebrave.org. We fight together PTSD. All right, here comes Jack Hughes. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Moran. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jack Hughes, and you're watching The Breakdown Show. And now, The Break It Down Show, with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, Jack Hughes. Everybody knows Jack Hughes because he was the front man for a band called Wang Chung. And uh, an internationally famous band, a world-famous band, actually probably more than anything an American famous band, but we like to think of ourselves as important as the world. Uh, But uh, you wrote some songs that will stay with us for the rest of our lives and probably outlive us by many, many uh, centuries. So um, the thing that we're we're intrigued by, though, Pete and I, is uh, that you have carved for yourself quite a career as a songwriter, and you survived uh, pop superstardom that has been the undoing of many. Yes. And uh, somehow you've not just survived it, but thrived from uh, from it. Your latest uh, your latest uh, release comes out in September, mm-hmm. and um, and uh, you wrote it during uh, the pandemic. Yeah. So we're very interested in that, and I just want to tell our listeners it's uh, it's a rock album. Uh, there are horns. It's uh, the very mature compositions. You've always written very mature compositions and, and very, uh, I mean, clearly an educated musician, not just a pop star. Sure. Uh, but this is this, I think, is a rock <laughs> album. Um, whereas you know, many of us ha- know your work as having a lot of synth stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I would say your native instrument is guitar, is it not? It is, yeah. I started playing guitar when I was eight years old, <clears throat> so wow. I'm still practicing, you know. <laughs> but, uh, okay. but yeah, that's the instrument I feel most comfortable with. Yeah. Well, as Pete told you before we got on the air, uh, I'm a drummer in a uh, in a British rock band called the Uncommonwealth, and yeah. we play from all the British invasions. Cool. And uh, of course, we play everybody have fun tonight. But I am partial to dance hall days. Okay. Yeah. That's the more British sounding song, I guess. Which one of the two do you like better? Uh, I like them both. You know, uh, I think Dance All Days was uh, an earlier track when we were based uh, in London. Um, Certainly, it was a track uh, that got assigned to Geffen Records in Los Angeles uh, and made that transition for us, yeah. But I think it sort of has a a sort of British sound to it, if you like. Uh, With Everybody Have Fun Tonight, uh, we recorded a lot of that album in Los Angeles. We were working with a producer called Peter Wolf, um, mm-hmm. who uh, Peter had all kinds of hits with all kinds of people, uh, including we built this city on rock and roll around the same time as he had everybody have fun tonight. So, um, yeah, so it's a more of an American sound, I guess. But I think they're both good. Sorry, I've got some message coming up here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I enjoy them both. And more importantly, the crowds enjoy them both. <clears throat> That, I mean, and that really affords you a lot of freedom to be the artist that you want to be now. I mean, you have to, when we were talking to Andy Summers, you know, he's very artistic. His, he doesn't have to make music that is popular in terms of pop music, right? He's, he gets yeah. to make what he wants yeah. to make. 
And, yeah. and so because for him specifically, he said he is on the frontier of art from his perspective. Like there's no one ahead of him. That's his job is to push the boundaries. Cool. Does that resonate with you? Yeah, I guess it does actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can get that with Andy, you know, because obviously he has strong jazz influences and in he's playing and, uh, you know, he, he made a great album of Thelonious Monk tunes and uh, yeah, great. So <clears throat> I can get that, you know, I, I think some musicians are in it for the music, you know, I, I know everybody seems to think, oh, people are in it for the money, you know, uh, but there's plenty of other things you could do if you wanted to make money. <laughs> uh, so um, I think with music, it, it is a constant learning process. And if you're in that space where you want to learn, where you're constantly finding new <clears throat> music that inspires you, then, then yeah, I agree with Andy, you're, you're sort of on your own cutting edge. <laughs> I think... Um... Well, I want to I want to go back to uh, what you just said about being in it for the music because w with with a lot of artists who are in it for the money that's the undoing you know they get they get caught up in the in the trappings and uh, I think it, you were famous for really just sort of continuing to have a really normal life and not uh, driving a Ferrari. <laughs> what was with that? Yeah. My manager encouraged us to have a pension fund rather than a Ferrari, so that was, a, <laughs> that was good. Not exactly rock and roll, but sensible, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you had a great manager. So, but you guys, when you signed to Geffen at the time, you had a you had a deal with Arista first of all, right? Yeah, we did. Yeah. And and they were they wanted to drop you, and so how did the deal with Geffen materialize? <clears throat> well, I think. Arista were in two minds, you know, we released uh, our first album uh, with, with Arista, this album called Huang Chan, which was how, how we spelled the name of the band in those days. <clears throat> and essentially, you know, uh, for record companies, they are in it for the money. And, um, and then that didn't really make the money they expected it to do. So they were in two minds, you know, uh, but I think they wanted to make a second album. I, I think that was where the, the critical thing came really, you know, because they were willing to take us on for another album and most bands would kind of you know better than bird in the bush or whatever it is bird in the hand <laughs> yeah it? yeah so um but our, we had a new manager at that point uh, david massey <clears throat> and david was absolutely sure that we should sign to an american label uh feeling that the sort of musicality that we had uh would never really work in in great britain and um uh, which isn't to say we couldn't have hits and stuff but i i, I I totally understood what he was saying. You know? And uh, I think when we signed to Geffen, and particularly when we went to Los Angeles and met people there, uh, it was a whole different vibe. And they really did understand the music. And I think in those days, um, <clears throat> there was a sort of sense of Wang Chung being like a sort of new wave, steely Dan, in a sense, you know. Um, in fact, yeah, there was I could a time when we were going to think about working with Gary Katz, who produced a lot of steely Dan stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that was a, <clears throat> an interesting set of possibilities. You know, the, the life in the music business is full of interesting possibilities. You know? Yeah, I'm curious when you when you hear stuff like you're like the, uh, you know, British Steely Dan. One of the things that it's, it's interesting to me, and I, I'm kind of just formulating this thought, but <clears throat> some bands get America and they make it and we get them. Some bands come to America and, and they, they don't. We don't get them. And the same is true going the other direction, right? Like we had Susan yeah. Quattro on, right? She's from here, but she made it over there. You know, uh, yeah. we didn't know who Jimi Hendrix was until you guys figured it out for us, right? Very good yeah. yeah, what is what is it? Paul Weller is another one that I always talk about. You know, he's fantastically successful in Great Britain, but, um, you know, just pissed off the wrong people, including himself, you know, <laughs> and just and he's never really found a firm footing here. What, yeah, what is yeah. it about a band like you guys were able to do it on both sides? What, mm. what, how do you figure that out? Yeah, I, if I knew the secret, I could probably sell it. You know, <clears throat> I, I'm not sure what it is. It's maybe a certain sense of sensibility. I, I think in the UK, you know, it's the music business was always very fashion oriented. And uh, so you've got to have that bit of it down, you know, uh, and they <clears throat> the, not so much the people but the press uh intrinsically distrust professionalism in music <laughs> you know so if you look like you know what you're doing they're suspicious that you've got some sort of key 
that you, and you're cheating <laughs> somehow, you know what I mean? And they prefer their rock stars to be heroin addicts, leather jackets, and a mess, you know. And fair enough, out of that comes a lot of great creativity. But I think in the States, um, I don't know whether it's still the case, but certainly the media in the States, and particularly the DJs, they expected bands to be professional and to be musically uh, adept, educated. Uh, and to be interested in the business in a properly applied kind of way, you know, so pretending that you couldn't care less about everything. <clears throat> Oasis are a good example, you know, who kind of were massive in the UK, but their attitude didn't translate at all into the States, you know, even though the music should have been huge, you know. So uh, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, you, you got this kind of, um, at, as it were, when I got to LA, I realized that the people in the music business and they really treated it like a business. They were very serious about it. They knew a lot about it. And they were very kind of um, turned on by that, that thing. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't just wanting to get laid or stoned or whatever, whatever else. Not that they didn't want to do that, but, you know, it wasn't quite as high on the list as it was for the English guys. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the clarification on that. I just want to properly shout out your new album coming out September 3rd. It's called Electro Acoustic Works 2020. It was the album created uh, during the pandemic. And I want to talk about the influences of that. But I, I must uh, one last time go back to dance all days because uh, for two reasons. Number one, because one very interesting thing that you and I have in common, uh, we both have fathers who were sax players. All right. And yeah. that we kind of cut our teeth playing with our dads. Okay. Which that's, is, yeah. that's an experience that I, at the time, protested, uh, <laughs> but, but would not ever trade for the world now. Yeah. Um, how much of that influence still remains in you? Strong, you know. Uh, <clears throat> my, my dad was, uh, as you say, a saxophone player. He was a, a jazz musician. I guess he really got into music. Um, so he was in a military band, you know, like right after the Second World War. So like around between like 1948 and 1950, mm -hmm. he had to do national service. And he did that in the military band. And uh, way, to, way, to, way to do national service. He, well, he did it in the UK, but they were actually in Berlin at, at the time. So oh. I think this, oh. around the time of the Berlin airlift. And so all pretty kind of uh, intense and stuff. You yeah. Know? <clears throat> But as a result, I think my dad's attitude to music, which was the attitude of a lot of his contemporaries, was that music was like being in the military, <laughs> you know, so it was uh, you were as good as your last gig. Um, <clears throat> you, you know, if you were on time for a gig, you were late. Um, you know, the, the loyalty to your band members came before absolutely anything, almost before your wedding day <laughs> sort of thing, you know. <clears throat> So he had this very sort of disciplined approach to it, you know. And I think he never really understood how I made money as a musician because I never seemed to be gigging. <laughs> I was always <laughs> in the studio making making records, you know, and that which is what I love doing, you know. Uh, so I think he was always a little confused about uh, about what I was doing, you know. So uh, so there's always that thing, you know, and there's part of it's you know it's full of love and mutual admiration and part of it's kind of there's a sort of antagonism there you know so uh, but uh, I guess growing up you know there was jazz in the house and <clears throat> when I heard the Beatles for the first time that really did go you know this is my music uh, and my parents don't get it and that was very important to me you know, to define my own sort of place in the in the musical world yeah that's rock and roll right whatever makes your parents uncomfortable is rock and roll uh, yeah. What, another bass player we've had on the show, he was an interpreter for me in, in Iraq. And he talks about how his dad made him go out and, you know, play keyboard, play the bass. And he would book gigs for them in Kuwaiti malls. And he was like, it was great to go out and play, but I didn't want to play these. Like, these are not gigs that you want as a musician, right? So do you have similar things? Your dad's influence was like, oh, man. Like, yeah. You know. No, I totally get it. And similarly, you know, I played in my dad's band. It, it was... I mean, looking back on it, it was an incredible training, you know, because I was working with these obviously much older guys. I, I was literally 12, 13, that sort of age when I was playing bass in his band, you know, and all these guys were, well, they seemed like incredibly odd to me, but I guess they were like 30 or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but yeah, sort of keeping up with them um, and learning to read the charts. That, that was the thing, you know, it was all, I didn't know the music, so you had to read the charts. The bass parts I could read, 
guitar parts were tougher. But as I got older, I sort of started getting the guitar parts. But it meant that I grew up, <clears throat> you know, surrounded by musicians listening to other musicians play. And, uh, and I think in rock bands, that, that's one of the things you have to be able to do. You have to be able to sort of react almost instantaneously and, um, you know, be able to sort of fit in with whatever vibe is going on and try and enhance it, of course. <clears throat> That's what made you guys the Steely Dan of New Wave, I think. <laughs> your maybe. your ability to hear everybody else, listen to everybody else. Um, and then if you'll if you'll indulge me, I, I must nerd out on the song dance hall days because I love uh, dotted subdivisions. And uh, so, how did you lay the drums for that? How much of that was machinery? How much of if any of it was live? What did you do? Well, it was was a, a lindrum that we were using. It was a lindrum, uh, okay. And and it was very hard to defeat yeah. the natural way the drum machine works in 16s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? So I forget how we did it because it's not quite, it's not just like straight triplets, it's somewhere else, you know. Right. Uh, you know, we all, uh, Nick and I and Chris Hughes as well, were all massive fans of Little Feet and how they would get <clears throat> that sort of- Wait a minute, did Chris rhythm. Hughes work on that with you? Chris Hughes was produced it, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. that explains a lot. Yeah. 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 Well, that was one of the things that we wanted to work with him because the Burundi thing with the Adam, Adam and the Ants records has that yeah. same slightly sloppy kind of ding, 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 yep. ding, just a little thing. swung. Yeah. yeah. So he understood that and he understood how it wasn't just a question of programming triplets or, you know, putting a tempo, you know, in some mathematical relationship to, to make it all work. You know, it was a feel thing essentially, you know, and it took yeah. forever to get it, but we, we got it or well, some version of it. You know? Yeah, I, I want to say for our listeners, I want to say for our listeners, um, if you don't know, uh, we've had a couple of episodes with Chris Hughes. He's a he's a hero of mine as a drummer and a producer, and um, and for and for the contemporary uh, listeners who who get this reference, he was Jay Dilla before Dilla, and uh, the the um, ability for him to take a limb drum and figure out a way to swing it just a little bit uh, really says a lot. Mm. What were you saying, Pete? I was going to say, uh, we've had Chris on the show a couple of times that, you know, he's uh, more than an acquaintance, maybe a little less than a friend, not that we're not friendly with him. But uh, he, John had a question for him, and I love this story, so I thought we'd relate it to you. And But John tells it better than I do. So, John, will you tell the Chris Hughes drum part story? Well, you know, I'm, I'm trying to endure playing Everybody Wants to Rule the World. And, okay. and I'm, ha yeah, and I'm having a hard time you know, just riding out the triplet all the way through. I mean, that's a, that's a feat of endurance. Yeah. So I asked him, you know, Hey, what would you consider for a shortcut? You know, should I play it in eighth notes? Should I what? And he just essentially said, just, just fucking play it. <laughs> just cut it out and fucking play it, which is, you know, probably an answer that would have come from our dads too. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Stop thinking and play. Yeah. 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 I want to ask a, another question on New Wave, and I'm curious. I asked Chris this. We asked uh, another artist recently. When people say New Wave, first off, you get kind of typecast, like especially you, like you're sort of bound by this genre. But it doesn't at all. Like you listen to your music, and it's like, yeah, you've had some New Wave elements, but you're not a New Wave musician. I wouldn't say. Um, what is New Wave? I know it when I hear it. Like the Go Go's are punk and they're new wave and all these other things. When we look back at genres, it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. And you guys, for sure, dance hall days, have fun tonight, even live and die in LA. These are hit songs and they sound new wavy, but I don't know. Like, I know when I hear, I can describe the blues, I can describe funk, I can describe like this is why this is disco and not funk. What is, what is that with new wave? What makes something a new wave song? Hmm. I'm always in two minds about this whole genre thing, you know, because, uh, in, in a way, I think it's looking at music from the wrong end of the telescope. You know, you're, you're sort of uh, <clears throat> looking usually at like a sort of bunch of bands who come from a similar time frame, maybe a similar place in England, you know, uh, and, and seeing the similarities and saying, well, well, here, let's call it this new wave jazz or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and then you try and fit the artists into that into that thing, you know, and the artists, of course, are doing their own thing, as you said in the earlier part of the conversation you're trying to define yourself and you're on your own cutting edge you know and even when you're being slotted into the uh, the genre you know and you're and i guess you're aware of the, the spirit of the time you know and 
the spirit of the time uh, you know it was obviously lindrums it was uh, ppg wave synthesizers it was the fair light you know all those things contribute to the, the physical sound you know but i guess there's a sensibility as well and i guess the thing that to me unites those bands was you know we all came out of the punk thing in a way we, we all would have been cutting our teeth when punk was the big thing uh and then with punk it was very like unfashionable to like even the beatles <laughs> you know uh they were considered way too sort of sell out musical like a boy band or something you know <clears throat> uh but i think all of us new wavers uh had this closet sense of like we were huge beatles fans we probably also liked uh American bands like Little Feet and Todd Rundgren and the Beach Boys. And <clears throat> so the new wave thing in a sense was bringing that kind of, um, as it were, multi-layered musical thing and trying to stick it into the punk sensibility that we were coming out of, where there was quite a lot of attitude and quite a lot of aggression almost. Um, but trying to sort of uh, mix that with, uh, that, with the, for want of a better word, that sort of musical quality, the art qualities that you get on Beatles records. And, uh, Beach Boys records. And you had a new technology that yeah. seemed needed to be mastered by somebody. Yeah, I mean, I think it was absolutely the, the beginning of computer music, you know, or, or, or so like din drums, and <clears throat> you were definitely working with multi track tape. So, you know, rather than when you look at the Beatles output and it's like, this track is like take 18 and this is take 37 you know there's no take 37 of dance all days you know there's just <laughs> the one track that we were working on that we built up you know through layering it and layering it on the premise that if you got every layer right uh, the totality would be great um, which in retrospect i think was mistaken <clears throat> i think you it adds a certain amount of sterility to it actually um, but uh, th these days i much prefer playing uh, in a more live kind of version and it's possible it's also it's not possible these days but it's possible to play with the musicians together in the room but uh now that you've you know now that you've <laughs> sort of uh pushed away from you know the classification um and your music has it has outlived the the newness the newness of the technology how yeah. would you classify uh electroacoustic 2020 what what box do you put that in Mm. Well, I've always consciously tried to make it not in a box, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and each track, <clears throat> in a sense, points in different directions. Um, so I guess the first track, which we released as a single, is um, we got to work together. And that, to me, consciously evokes the sort of 1970s sense of um, <clears throat> kind of funk and rock that you might get on, say, a Buddy Miles album, you know. Um, yeah, it's uh, greasy. Yeah, so I, I wanted to kind of get that. Um, <clears throat> the tracks that come after that are much more like a sort of seventies prog type thing. So I think the seventies prog element is a is a strong one, <clears throat> and that's sort of what I grew up with, really, and what I still adore. Yeah, I, I love those old old albums, you know. Uh, but I also wanted to get a sort of Miles Davis element in there. So there's a couple of tracks that are really led by the trumpet. You know, and I know to some people that means trumpet means jazz. You know, so when you're thinking in this genre driven thing, it's like, well, what's Jack doing? He's made a rock record with jazz on it, and it's all, you know, <clears throat> but to me, it's no, it's like the trumpet's got a certain kind of expression and it leads you in a certain direction, you know, and then the rock elements pull you in this direction. To me, it's like trying to create a, <clears throat> an interesting meal, <laughs> if you like, you know, maybe with a, a few different ingredients from different countries, you know. Yeah, I'm glad you use that that simile because I, I think of it that way too. And I think that a lot of younger uh, listeners, um, and you know, my experience is limited to my kids and they had a lot of exposure. So what I'm seeing of them now is that they, they don't have the same sort of genre. I mean, those were our identifiers. That was yeah. our, our virtue, si virtue signals when that. we were kids. Yeah, 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 and now there's a lot less of that. So they're not afraid to see an artist who uh, maybe came up in one genre, but is unafraid to explore something else. I get that, um, yeah. yeah. And that's an important point, I think, you know, because certainly, you know, the records you carried under your, the LPs you carried under your arm to a friend's yeah. party said a lot about who you were in those days, you know, and, and maybe being young, you were much more, or I was anyway, much more narrow about my, my taste and so 
But I think the great thing about streaming these days, and obviously there's lots that's not great about streaming for musicians especially, uh, but the great thing in terms of consumers is there's access to absolutely everything. And yeah. um, so that, that can only be a good thing, I think. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, once again, shout out acoust, acoust, uh, excuse me, Electroacoustic 2020 is the new album that comes out September 3rd. Now, uh, yeah. aside from We Gotta Work, together which is on youtube everybody can go listen to that track that's your sampler uh the rest of the album's not out yet but i i really encourage everybody to buy it on vinyl yes vinyl. make sure you buy it on vinyl uh yeah, jack has gone to great lengths to press <laughs> this thing on vinyl and to preserve the fidelity of this great record um because it's important to do and not only is it important to do but you guys don't have any place to press vinyl there yeah. anymore no the uk doesn't have anything so we're having it pressed in a place in the netherlands which is ah. uh, super great uh, it's called deep grooves and they kind of have a carbon neutral uh, emphasis in the way they approach it obviously vinyl's not a terribly friendly <laughs> substance you know uh, but they do a lot of offsetting and stuff and um yeah they're good guys actually and they're very kind of committed to maintaining the high fidelity of the of the album and uh so with this album you know i recorded it here at home like in this very room that i'm sitting in so not in a studio as such although i did record the drums in a in a real studio um yeah. but i tried to get the fidelity of it as as good as i could and uh and i actually played it to a couple of well actually four or five friends uh who sat in this room and listened to it on my uh, hi-fi system and they were blown away by the what they said was the clarity of it you know and again i think maybe people aren't so used these days to listening to uh, music in that hi-fi kind of way Do you know what i mean you get very used to listening on a little bluetooth speaker or even quite a good bluetooth speaker but that's still not hi-fi you know so having a good turntable going through a nice warm amp and uh, blasting out through speakers that's that's the way to hear it. yeah speakers that are that are encased in wood <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah, the um, the difference between those types of experiences are, you know, I would liken to, um, I don't know, maybe smoking a cigar, you know, uh, yeah. where it's a commitment. You have to, if you decide you're going to listen to this album on vinyl, you have to kind of commit. Yeah, and 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 surrender to the experience, and and uh, I think you'll be paid back dividends. Well, I think that's real, very true. You know, it's. Um... There's a great book, actually, by a guy called David Hepworth uh, called A Fabulous Creation. And uh, it, I think the subtitle is How the Album Saved Our Lives or something like that. And he basically dates the sort of the heyday of the album from 1967, Sgt. Pepper, and ending with uh, Michael Jackson's Thriller in 1983, I think that was, or maybe four. Mm. And he says during that time, you know, the album was the the way that you listen to and consume music and, and how great that was for artists because it gave you not just the single, you know, yeah. uh, it gave you all these different windows into the different ways they thought and in some cases different members of the band stepping forward to, to give their, their view as it were. You know. And um, I really get that and I see the album's a great way of uh, artists, you know, bringing their ideas in, into the world, if you like, you know, in a fully rounded kind of way. Yeah, in a long form. Yeah. What exactly. what albums did you attach did you attach to and and continue to be influenced by? Mm, uh, I, th I think the Beatles' White Album was a massive album for me. Uh, and still continues to sort of define a lot of what I do. You know? So the album that I put out as a solo album before Electroacoustic Works uh, is an album called Primitive, which is mm -hmm. also a double album, and uh, and I wanted it to be a double vinyl album in a very deliberate sort of way. You know? Uh, but other albums that spring to mind, um, I'd say uh, David Bowie's Ziggy Stardust was. Yeah. There's a lot of albums, I think, that come after Michael Jackson that I think are important to the album era in the way they were constructed. Uh, things that yeah, come yeah. to mind. The Beastie Boys, License to Ill. I just yep. came in yep. and, and the DJ had a simple 45 minute set. <laughs> he just pressed play and then left it alone you know um sure, sure. dr j's the, the dre's the, car, the chronic that's not something that you would ever just take one you would let the whole thing play there's all kinds of them where they were 
fully contained. Yeah, that was definitely yeah. really composed as an album. Yeah, sure, sure. Do you yeah. still compose yeah. an album like that? Yes. What is the David Edwards' point was really about, the, as it were, the fashion for the listener. And I suppose once you got to CDs, the way people mm. consume music was very much they would skip tracks and. Uh, and also the CD format is kind of too long to sit and listen to in one uh, in one listen, you know. Whereas the album is just yeah. about the right attention span thing, you know. So. Yeah, but I do it gave you a natural things. intermission. Yeah. Sorry, I, I also I also enjoy that you that you made it at home, and yeah, one of the one of the things that I got excited about was you know when I was a kid and my parents would travel. They would leave us at home. You know, when I was in high school, I was old enough not to burn the house down. So if, if they went away for a few days, they'd leave me at home. And then I would turn our living room into my rehearsal studio and I'd invite the guys over and we'd, and we'd play. And and uh, I, I imagined your process to be like that and, and COVID to sort of be like a long excuse to turn your house into that. Absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, what would normally be a living room <laughs> for pe for most people is for me a, a sort of studio environment. You know, a mixture of living room and studio environment. And it means Chris Hughes, <laughs> which is very strange. <laughs> I'll call him back. But yeah, um, um, <laughs> yes, the, the the living room is my studio. I can sort of just. Yeah. The thing. The All right. Mac and the grand piano at the back. <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I also want to. Shout I want to out ask you about Josh McGill. Let me, let, let me just say that uh, uh, Josh McGill. Yeah. You know it's, what we've seen and heard so far is fantastic, and and I really identify with his playing because he's gr a great pocket drummer. He's a great accenter of things. He really takes seriously his job of not just holding down the time, but of making everybody else really sound great. And uh, so I just wanted to tip my cap to him. Well, that's very nice, and he'll appreciate that. Yeah, but he is a really great drummer, sort of cast in the old school. Uh, you know, of, as you say, he's a sort of supportive drummer rather than someone who sort of um, uh, tries to come to the front. You know, but really creative. You know, there's a track on the album called. Um, uh, don't waste words and uh, when I took that into the studio it was there was no drums on it at all and I was thinking that, that was the first uh, that I didn't really want to put drums on it but I said to Josh just just play along with it and, and see what happens you know and he really came up with these really creative parts you know using a lot of ride cymbal and just tongs and stuff you know so he's a you know very creative musician great songwriter himself actually I, I don't know if you've ever heard any of his stuff but uh, uh, he was in this band called Siddhartha who uh, a kind of Canterbury-based, um, in a sense, even more seventies prog <laughs> than I am, <laughs> and uh, even though they're like half my age. You know. So um, yeah, no, they're really talented guys, and, and Josh is such a sweetheart as well. You know, so wonderful guys to work with. Guys to work with. Yeah, I'll be yeah. really interested to hear that because I sort of saw, you know, as I watched him play and listened to him play, it, he reminded me of. Yeah. You know, we all have that. We all have the influence of the old guy in our life who, who just manages to have a creative vocabulary and doesn't need to say much because he just says the perfect, most poignant thing right at the right time. All right. Cool. Yeah. 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 Well, he has that. <laughs> when you record there was a at comment. Home. Oh, good. No. I was going to when you record at home, you have the ability to do everything right there at your fingertips, but you also lose the uh, the requirement to be better than what you're capable of doing, right? So how do you ensure that, you know, good and great are, you're stressing that, you know, because look, I talked to Chris and he's like, a lot of people just don't need me to produce anymore, but, but they do because he's going to shove you out of your comfort zone and go, how is it over there? And you can always come back. But you need to get sure. shoved out there. How do you replace that that vibe? How do you replace that magic that happens? Yeah, you two talks about when God enters the studio and something just comes to you. How do you do that when you're at home? Yeah, that's yeah. a good question. You know, and certainly with Chris, I often had that experience. You know, I know that I sort of play better <laughs> when Chris is around, you know, because I'm trying harder. And I sort of uh, in some probably slightly uh Adolescent way, want to impress him, you know, or I don't know quite what it is, you know. But uh, 
that's happening. But yeah, I, I think working here, what I try and do is, because what I'm most aware of is the possibility of not being spontaneous, you know, that you can sort of get an idea and do take after take after take and, and you know all that stuff and I try not to do that I try and um, sort of um, <clears throat> you know just set the mics up uh, and then go and have something to eat and then come in and sit down and do a take you know and and really try and get the vibe uh, going rather than get it playing it absolutely right you know and then in some cases uh, I push myself like on electroacoustic works the, the last track I think on side two, which is part of this long extended 20 minute track, you know, has got these guitar arpeggio things that I can't play, <laughs> basically, you know. So that took some <laughs> practice to try and get those together, you know, and then uh, I, I just kind of, uh, well, in a couple of places I did a bit of cheating and editing and stuff, but really I just tried to get those to work and phrase in a, in a natural way. So I guess it's pushing it's yourself just, creatively. <laughs> As, as far as you as far as you can i think that the difference between uh your work from the 80s and your work now is um largely that the technology back then sort of you know was um they were, they were like handcuffs golden as they were you know and and, and i would say that yeah the, your your music now breathes so much more and yeah. it's so much more organic and sonic. Yeah. No, I think you're, you're absolutely right about that. The technology was emerging, you know, of drum machines, synths, and, you know, multi-track recording and all of that stuff. Um, but it was still in its infancy, and it was difficult to handle, and it was very time-consuming to use it. Mm. Uh, whereas now everything is much quicker. Uh, and I think, in a way, the, the way I write now is more organic. You know, there are certain tracks, like, uh, don't waste words, for example, <clears throat> where I don't use a click track and stuff. I just just play it naturally uh, and let the tempo sort of ebb and flow a little bit, you know. And I think all those things are really important in the way an album feels. And of course, in the '80s, it was all about click tracks and drum machines. And and although that felt like a great release in a way from working with <laughs> real drummers who could never stay in time and stuff. You know? <laughs> uh it, it was you know it's always a balance isn't it you know and uh I, I i've often said to people you know i think in the early 80s there was this sense that you could make the perfect pop record because the technology was there to allow you to do it you know and there was this sense that everything had to be perfect whatever that means you know and i think that was kind of a restrictive way of thinking whereas we, we should have played it a lot more free in a sense you know but that, that wasn't the spirit of the time you know? yeah we knew well talking about eighth notes i want to nerd out on your writing process and then does it come before the music or, or does it matter because you're clearly you're, you have an album out and you're like oh i can't promote this album but i can go in the studio and write about donald trump about a pandemic all these things are just writing themselves you're not the first yeah. artists that we've had on the show that talked like there was just so much stuff i had so much time i had to make an album you know so yeah talk about yeah. the writing yes yeah. yeah well with yeah. electroacoustic works it, it i actually um got into at the beginning of the pandemic you know i did have this sense of like this is great <laughs> i mean i know it's dreadful for so many people <laughs> but for me yeah. it was like you know so i'm here in the house i'm on my own most of the time um you know i really can do what i want you know so i started listening to audio books like i'd have breakfast and then just listen to an audio book for an hour you know and i listened to a book on ted hughes who's a, an english poet and uh, married to sylvia plath for a while so, which was a very tempestuous, difficult relationship. But it was an incredible book about him and a great insight into how he wrote poetry, which is all about writing in the, about writing in the moment and about what's in front of him, you know. It's not like imaginative in the kind, I mean, it's highly imaginative, but he's not making things up, do you know what I mean? He's trying to describe right what's there in front of him. So I tried to do that with the lyrics on, on this album, you know. And certainly we've got to work together is just talking about what was happening on the on my computer. You know, I, I don't have a TV, but I, you know, you catch news on um, <clears throat> social media and all that stuff. You know, and um, so trying to document that. You know, so trying to document that. And, um, but I, I do sort of think that um, during the 80s, I was quite often led by the music, and then I try and get the words to fit around it. 
And these days I'm much more led by the lyrics and then I allow the music to try and bring up the emotion of those words. Along those same you lines, have a, as, as a guy with a musical education, how much do you chart versus jam? Uh, it's all jam when I'm working. Oh, good. Uh, you know, I chart for uh, so the trumpet parts. Uh, I, I, I wrote out charts for that insofar as I needed them. You know. But um, with that, that whole mu music education thing is interesting, you know, because I think uh, a lot of people think, oh, you know, if you can't read music, uh, you don't know music theory. Uh, then you're a lesser musician. And I don't agree with that. I think, uh, you know, it's useful to do those things, but it's not essential. You know, having a good ear and having a, a powerful sort of emotional attachment to the music is, is the most important thing in rock music, that, that whole, that kind of area that we're talking about. You know? And do you play the mouth trumpet when you're writing the trumpet part? Like, do you go, you know, do you do that? Or do you, is that in your head? Yeah, yeah, it, it was kind of, well, initially that melody that the trumpet plays, you know, I, I kind of sang it, you know, and I was going to, oh, okay. you know, Rob, Robert Wyatt, um, who's a very big artist over here, maybe not so much in the States, but he quite often vocalizes a melody, doesn't have lyrics and stuff. And, um, and I love how he does that, but. I couldn't make up my mind about whether to do it like that or whether to get a, a real trumpet player in, you know. So in the end, I, I found this great guy, Daniel Cano, who lives in Canterbury. He's um, from the south of Spain, but uh, amazing player, really good, you know, and he really nailed it. But I sort of kept my vocal in as well. You know, I kind of like the two colors together. Well, you, um, were, you were in L.A., you were signed to Geffen Records at the height of Wang Chung. Yeah. With a bunch of the studio guys around LA and uh, employed, you know, the the top studio sessions, session players and and, uh, and book a big studio. Mm -hmm. did, did you make it? I think my question is, did you make a Steely Dan record? <laughs> well, I suppose you could maybe look at the warmer side of cool, which is the last album that Wang Chung made as a kind of a sub Steely Dan record, you know. Um, yeah, there, there was a bit, you know, we had Vinnie Caliuta playing drums on it. And um, uh, I forget, there was a guitar player who was on it for a while as well. I mean, the thing was that Peter knew because Peter had been in Frank Zappa's band. He knew all of those, um, sure. those guys, you know, who were either in all those guys. Or Frank Zappa's band. So they were on hand and Patrick okay. O'Hearn, the bass player, used to come and hang out in the studio a lot. Um, obviously Nick was playing the bass parts in a slightly kind of, I'm the bass player kind of way. Yeah. But um, yeah, that was good. And those guys are obviously amazing players. And um, that was one of the great things about working in LA was having these guys around and, and having that sense of um, you know musical excellence of, of that kind being like, nothing to be embarrassed about <laughs> which you sort of would be in, in london in a way you know i mean you kind of keep it a bit quiet yeah. you know so uh, it's great and the singers as well i remember yeah. working with saida garrett and uh, uh she would you know work with michael jackson yeah. all the time and wrote man in the mirror and stuff you know and she sings on everybody have fun tonight and she used to right. come to the studio and just hang out and, and sing on stuff you know it's just wonderful really great times so really going to L.A. when you did was perfect for you. It was, yeah. Musically and otherwise. Watched, um, I recently watched a movie called Laurel Canyon. I don't know whether you guys have had a chance to. Yeah. To yeah, that, made me feel that was great. Very nostalgic about L.A. You know, and, and even though we were there, I guess that movie goes up to about 1975 and we were there yeah. in 84. So, so it was kind of all over. But obviously yeah. David Geffen was a big part of that scene. And signing to Geffen Records was kind of, yeah. like, there was some continuity there, you know. And, um, you know, I, I've just bought the, uh, the reissue of Deja Vu, uh, Crosby, Stewart, Nash and & Young, and, and that to me is one of the greatest albums ever. Do you know what I mean? I adore that record. Because of the vibe and the playing and the, the, just the sound of it as well, it's just so beautiful. You know? So, yeah, but I, I, being in LA at that time was, was, was wonderful. It was, you know, it's quite different now. It's quite different now, as we all know. <laughs> you know, but, but, uh, but back then it was quite, uh, it was still had this sort of strange mixture of urban and rural right next to each other, you know, and, uh, and Laurel Canyon really summed that up, you know. Yeah. I'm curious how much in your day to day life does music 
impact what you do. Like we had um, uh, the DOC, who's a very notable rapper from the NWA and that kind of thing. And I was telling him that when I make a smoothie, I, I take his his song, his tune, his word, and I turn it into, you know, I get a smoothie, I get a smoothie. You know, it's like, so there's always some kind of musical element in my day. And I'm not even, you know, a musician. I, mean, I can play the guitar a little bit and sing a little bit, but it's constantly around me, right? And I just sort of let it flow right out of my mouth as it's, as it's, in my head do you have a similar experience or do you get enough outlet that you'd like quiet i mean how is that for you no i mean i have music on no i, I listen a lot to the classical station here in the uk um <clears throat> but if i'm not doing that i bought a cd player because <laughs> i had thousands of cds so i sort of just put one of those on and basically if, if there's not music coming at me then there's music constantly playing in my head you know um that's I, I think people who know me sometimes they you just sometimes space out a bit during and it's because yeah because i'm just listening to a bit of music in my head it plays like it's like having a photographic memory do you know what i mean it's like a, so i just sit and listen to it it's great <laughs> is that ever triggered you by made sound your new record with your guitar in your hand mm -hmm. sorry again I was going to say, is, is that ever triggered by day-to-day -day sounds in your life? Like uh, I was in a train station in Paris, at, uh, I don't know, Garda East or somewhere. And there was this alarm like, doo, doo, and I'm like, yeah, doo, and it would make like a tune for me, build into something. I wasn't doing it. My brain just does it, right? Does yeah. that trigger work for you? Sometimes, sometimes. I remember sitting in a concert hall, like waiting area one time, listening to the air conditioning unit playing this kind of chord that was like phasing slightly, you know, and the, yeah, that was great. So, yeah, you hear music in all sorts of places, you know. Uh, I was going to ask how you tracked the new record because it is so vintage. You have a horn section. You made the record with your guitar in your hand. You know, there there's a lot of there's a lot of organic uh, and breathing elements in the record. Did you uh, did you track it to tape? Did you use Pro Tools? What did you do? Um, no, I was using Logic actually um okay and um, which i think is is really good uh recording 24 bit uh 44.1 um wow but uh i took it to the to a really good mastering place uh, metropolis mastering in, in in london and uh john davis mastered it and he sent it out through some really beautiful outboard gear which i think makes the top end particularly great and uh you know thumps the low end as well you know so it gets a lot out of it you know and i think um you know listening to a lot of uh well, those sort of seventies records, I I sort of got that in a way the secret to getting a really good sound is not to have too many instruments playing, you know, and um, so I suppose I approach it like that, you know, the, there's a guitar part and a bass part and a keyboard part, maybe second guitar, but I don't layer it up too much, you know, uh, and I'm lucky to have some lovely guitars which give good focused sound, you know, and a decent like um, vocal mic and stuff, you know. So it's, uh, yeah, just going for that sort of clarity and natural sounds, um, you know, it, it just sounds pretty good, you know. And uh, and I try to, you know, if it was a trumpet part, then there's a real trumpet, you know, the sax part is a real sax player, you know, a friend of mine, Pete Grogan, who plays in a jazz band um, called Led Bib, uh, pretty out there, free jazz kind of thing, you know. Uh, and then uh, Baby and Solar, it's, it's, she sings on it, and, and she's just such an inspiring singer, you know. Um, so Pete and Baby, they did their parts in separate studios, you know, and sent it to me. Uh, but I was, you know, well, they, they're just great musicians, so they give you great energy, you know, and, and great parts. Now I really can't wait to hear the rest of the record because I now have to imagine that it was tracked in different places, that everybody sent you parts and you put them together because the, the record breathes in a way that, it, you know, the what little we've heard of it so far. It doesn't yeah. sound like that. It, sound no. like it, it sounds like it was all jammed and made in one room. Yeah, well, I deliberately try to make it a way. And, uh, and there are some tracks where I kind of... Um, <clears throat> There's one track called Slow Gears, uh, which is the trumpet led track, which sort of gets into this kind of jam. It feels like uh, the track plays and then the drums come in really quite late in the track and the musicians just sort of go to a slightly different place. And, uh, and I guess I sort of, I just kind of felt that as I was here. It was like really late one night, you know, and um, just played the guitar parts 
and it really wasn't planned at all, you know, but I sort of just left it for a few days and then came back to it um, and just kind of got into what was there, you know, and then worked around that. And, um, you know, again, Josh put the drums on quite late on the album. You know, so he had, you know, stuff to play with, you know, but he, he just sort of felt it. And um, that, that was very much how I wanted, I really wanted it to sound, you know, like, how did you get this to sound so live? And like, there's a lot of jamming going on when it was a lockdown album, where you, uh, you did a lot of it on your own, sort of thing. So that was the illusion I was trying to create. You know. Wow. Got my buddy has put a a comment in here talking about how um, during our, our we were seniors in 1987 and and during our trip to Disneyland, uh, your music and your videos were playing on that trip, and that makes me think about this show right now called Lupin on I think on Netflix, and it's it's French and there's a dog who's a character and that dog's name is Jacques. Okay, I can't believe that's on purpose, right? Like the, you're you're your cultural relevance seeps into all of these things in life. Do you ever just sit back and go, that belongs to me. That belongs to me. How on earth did you get, you know, but there's things that you create that just you've managed to get over the top. And so you rain down in a lot of different areas. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great way to look at it. You know, obviously <laughs> I, it isn't like that, but, uh, but I love the idea that the dog, the dog is called Jackie's. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> You know, going back to that time period, you um, you guys toured with Tina Turner. Yeah. Do are there any nuggets of uh, wisdom of hers that remain with you? Uh, well, I guess on the tour, you know, she was never around apart from one night when she came, and um, I think she watched their set, or maybe she was just around towards the end of it. Uh, and she, you know, we did photos together and all that stuff. I, I don't have them, sadly, but I would love to see those. Um, but she would tend to, you know, arrive in her limo like literally three minutes before she went on the stage, did her set brilliantly, you know, and then came off the stage back in the limo back to wherever she went to, you know. So she really did lead, lead a very, you know, she didn't participate at all in the extracurricular stuff that tours are made of, you know. Uh, but one thing I do remember with Tina is uh, doing Top of the Pops in the UK. And in those days, with Top of the Pops, uh, there's, there's always this, there was always this fight between the BBC and the Musicians' Union. So the Musicians' Union wanted the music to play the music and not have any recorded stuff. And the BBC wanted to have a, basically the musicians miming because it was too complicated to set up all the gear for different bands and all of that stuff you know and the record companies always wanted the bands to mind because you know if the sound was bad which it frequently was um you know then a band's career could just be torpedoed over overnight you know so anyway this particular time uh, we were doing uh, miming to the backing track but the lead vocals had to be live you know? So I was singing Dance All Days, which was you know, reasonably nerve-wracking, but it's, it's not a hard song to sing. But Tina Turner was there singing I Can't Stand the Rain or whatever was the contemporary hit that she was having. And she sang live, and I've never heard a voice like it. It just completely you know, made me melt into butter. <laughs> you know, it was like uh, such an incredible sound, and her presence and her whole kind of command of what she was doing was it's one of those things, you know, Anyway, I was a kid then, you know, sort of didn't really know anything about anything. But that was one of those things where you thought, wow, you know, it's like performing is a is something that I don't know anything about. Do you know what I mean? It's like I've got to get to that place, you know, where I can command it in that way. You know. Ah, true master. How about yeah. the cars? You you toured with the cars as well. We did. Uh, was that experience any different? Yeah, that, I mean, they were like a sort of art rock band. Um, I mean, it was a great tour for us in the sense that they were selling out these massive stadiums night after night, you know, so we were playing to 70,000 people a night, you know, and the stadiums were pretty full when we went on as the opening act, you know, because sometimes everyone's just in the bar until the opening act's finished, aren't they? And then they come in for the main thing. But people wanted to see us because we were new and Dance All Days was a, a big hit and everything. And um, yeah, and I, for, yeah, for me, it was all pretty stressful, I suppose, and a bit confusing. Uh, but the overall sense was the people, you know, really got into our set. And then the cars were great, but they had this policy of um, 
not talking to the audience you know so they would play you know whatever they played you know one of their hits and stuff you know the crowd would go wild and they would turn their back on the audience uh, you know for like 30 seconds and then they turn around and start the next song and you could feel that progressively picking off the crowd <laughs> you know yeah. and um, so people's experience at the end of it was kind of like yeah the cars were a bit boring which they weren't they were like meticulous in the way they did everything you know uh, but this stage thing was really, uh, I'm sure it was an arty, well-intentioned decision, <laughs> but it really wasn't working. You know? The people's sense was that we were great and the cars were a bit boring. So, uh, I, uh -huh. it, that was fine. <laughs> yeah. But there are acts that have that reputation. I mean, uh, the cars were for sure known to be a boring act. New Order is known to be a boring act. Elvis Costello, I saw him live, but I'm like, it's just, just not great. He's playing every song. A little bit faster to get through more so and then it's like there's nothing in it you know like i can listen to the cd at home well, debbie harry came on before elvis costello and kicked his ass because she talked to the crowd and you know right. she didn't just play the hits and, yeah. and i don't know what it is yeah. about musicians that make them want to have a show that isn't great but when you have your reputation for 40 years and it stays the same you know yeah. you're just a great alive act yeah well i think a lot of musicians kind of don't want to be showbiz do not mean they want to be musicians and like an art thing you know and i, I totally respect that but i get yeah. also the people are there they want to be part of it and they want to hear you talk inane stuff <laughs> you know like if everybody all right all that stuff you know they want that. so i i'm you know i i think you know new the the modern wang chun shows that i do with nick um i mean i haven't done them for a while but uh we're planning on doing some once we're able to play again you know uh, yeah, they're very kind of in, immersive, cohesive things, you know, and the audience is such an important part of it all. It's no good just playing at them. You know, you've got to kind of involve them in it as well. Yeah. Man, I really enjoyed this well, chat. It's so much fun. I think that, uh, you, you know... Me too. Yeah, and it's completely ahead, okay for you to say that you took you took the road with the cars oh. and you knocked them, and you knocked them out. <laughs> I guess that is what I'm saying. We applaud that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. I saw Jeff Beck and Stevie Ray Vaughan, and I love Jeff Beck and had the same experience. Jeff Beck was brilliant with the guitar in his hand. Stevie Ray Vaughan just came out and put a whooping on us. And, you know, and that was great. And that was what we what we remember. It, it is what you walk away going, wow, I'll never forget the way that felt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That is really important. No, Jeff Beck, wow. You know, I saw him at Ronnie Scott's, which is like a pretty small, relatively speaking, jazz club in 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 London. And I was sitting kind of like, you know, he's it's like where my hi-fi is here. <laughs> so I think I was like, his amplifier was literally 10 feet away from me sort of thing, you know. And it was the loudest thing I've ever heard in my life. But it wasn't painful, you know. It was uh, just exhilarating, and he just played the hell out of everything that he touched. You know, it was just, and I think playing in that small environment suited him really well, temperamentally and stuff. You know? It was just, just amazing. He is a god, you know, and uh, I think all guitarists ultimately think he has that mixture of technique and emotion in his playing. You know, it's, um, it's just an incredible thing to see. Yeah, and he plays with his entire hands. Absolutely, every little bit of it, both hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, you are going to tour Electroacoustic 2020. I would uh, love to. You you have some dates lined up so far. Well, we have some in the UK. Yeah, so we have uh, some uh, gigs uh, planned in mid September. By which time, I hope that the restrictions will be lifted, and uh, you know we can just. Uh, uh, be able to do those gigs you know uh, so there's one in london you can see it on my website which is www.jackhughes.com so uh, rather than trying to go through it all here but uh but yeah if you're in the uk come and see us and um obviously if there were opportunities to play some stuff in the states next year or whatever i would i would love them because i think american audiences would dig the music and dig the band and dig the way that live there's a certain amount of improvisation and a slightly more if you like sort of jazzy slant to things and I th then there is on the records you know I, did, yeah. I know that there was I'd a love to a, see you at a house of blues, blues somewhere yeah absolutely it would be yeah. wonderful to do that. Hollywood Bowl let's get, let's get him in the bowl <laughs> love that venue <laughs> yes 
<laughs> shows are selling out right now. Shows are selling out in, in the United States. California just opened today. Like we're open for, biz- for business again. So fantastic. Get out here. Let us spend some money on you. Yeah, I'd love that. Yeah, well, we should. Yeah. I mean, things are still kind of shut down here. It's, it's better than it was. Much better than it was. But music is still very restricted. Music, theatre, all the important things in life. You know, <laughs> you still can't do. So um, hopefully that will all stop in July though. And then we just got to be able to sort of travel to other countries, which seems to be another big hurdle to get over. But I, I guess, you know, I, I get we've all got to be careful and stuff. But um, yeah, I yeah, really can't wait to be, to be able to travel to the States again. I miss it a lot. Actually. Anything in closing, John? Jack, anything? Well, this has been fun. It's really great. And uh, I really appreciate you listening to well, you know, Electroacoustic Works and uh, the. Uh, We've got to work together and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, hope you guys really get into the album when it's when it, when it comes out. I'll, I'll send you advanced copies as soon as I get one. So uh, you can let me know.